Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Lori Benson. She's co-founded Intercom Information Systems in 1984, ran it for 25 years. She grew revenues from startup to $80 million with 150 employees across three offices. She successfully exited the company at the time of sale to Core BTS in 2009. She served on seven corporate boards and founded LSB Unlimited, where she advises CEOs, presidents, and entrepreneurs on strategy, growth, and much more. And now us. Lori, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. I really appreciate your time. You're a busy woman. And I know when right when we started talking, you go, okay, if we had to cover anything, what should we cover first? Because you, you're like, you have a lot of questions. So I want to hear some of your big lessons first before we get into everything else uh, with business. Because you ran this company and grew it from scratch with the, and obviously co-founded it. What are some of your big lessons along the journey? Since you're an entrepreneur yourself, you know that every day has, as it unfolds, reveals opportunities to learn. And while you can have the greatest of plans, I think some of the most lasting learning experiences are those that come from situations or experiences that were unanticipated. So one of those lessons I learned is to pay attention. Even never had my own agenda that precludes my openness to what I hear, what I see, and what I feel about what's happening around me. So in that context, a couple of the key lessons would, the first would be that to be open to possibilities that come your way. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a degree in nursing, and my focus was preventive health. I was a huge proponent of preventive health and wanted to be a clinical nurse practitioner in mental health at some point um, along the way. When I was working at the Red Cross Bloodmobile, right after I graduated, I met the branch manager's secretary from Xerox. And she approached me after her donation and said, Lori, I think you should come in for an interview with us. Hmm. At that time, Xerox had had a hiring freeze for three years. And they were going to hire three people with no business or sales background as part of a pilot. Well, as you can figure out, I was perfectly qualified for those criteria. No background in either. So I thought, well, I have nothing to lose and I'll go in for the interview. So I did and I was hired and I had a wonderful t career there for eight years, an extraordinary company. And um, I take great pride in the fact that they sought me out as a common ordinary person, which is exactly what I am. And they saw something past what I was doing that day. So my first lesson is clearly to be open to possibilities that come along the way on your way to your original goal. I'm I like that one. Thank you. And, and it's never ending. So most of the things I do are outside my area of, certainly outside my comfort zone. And so one of the lessons I've learned is by bumping out your boundaries, that is where the magic happens. Yeah. There is no question that there's no value that you can place higher than real experience and being an expert. I don't mean to minimize that. And you can have predictable success being an expert in the area. But I like to think about what about that unpredictable success that really comes at the edges and outside by bumping out the boundaries and really paying attention to what's possible. Um, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is really the size of our thinking. So learning that lesson of bumping out my boundaries um, has, I learned at an early age, all because somebody saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. What allowed you to be so open? Because I think most people would have been like, I'm a nurse, you know, thank you, I, you know, that's flattering, but I'm going to do the nursing thing. What, was there something in your childhood or growing up that allowed you to you know, be open like that? Oh, absolutely. Now, that did not mean I was courageous. I was open. There's a big difference. Um, I did not have an expected outcome, but I, I did recognize 
and act on the opportunity. So I got that philosophy from both of my parents. I came from a very small town called Milton here in Wisconsin, South Central Wisconsin. And the way we arrived at Milton was simply by following the herds of cattle. My father was a veterinarian. Oh, wow. well, you can imagine, I know you went to school here as well, back then, in the early 50s, they did not have a school of veterinary medicine here in Wisconsin. Hmm. So my mother and dad both graduated from Ohio State. My dad is a veterinarian and my mother um, had her master's in Latin. So she's an excellent communicator. They moved here, he became a herdsman and then started his own veterinary practice. My parents have both been deceased for many years. And what I have learned about them was certainly through their example while they were living and often more times um, from things I hear from others since they both passed. Mm. But my mother and father instilled in us at an early age that we should always be um, confident that there aren't limits in life, much more than the ones that you impose upon yourself. Mm -hmm. So they said, you know, here we believe in you, we support you, we encourage you, dream big and follow those dreams. And they yeah. instilled that upon my sisters and myself, and not only us, but so many in our community. And I see the impact of their inspiration. So frankly, you could say that, you asked me why I was open to it, I wouldn't have considered not being open to it. Hmm. In Milton, everybody was friendly and everybody was um, interested in each other and supportive of each other. So it wouldn't even have been appropriate for me to dismiss someone offering me an invitation. Yeah. So um, I'm very, very grateful for the, uh, the path that my parents put us on to be open to, to so many things in life and always thinking about the implications on others as well as yourself. Yeah, I like that. And um, so what were some of the big lessons you learned at Xerox then? Okay, so there I learned set your standards high because people like to be part of a winning team. And I learned a lot of principles from the company, including an integral part of the company was their core values and giving in the communities where they live and work. So they helped me establish and my team establish good habits for life. Now when I, I could write a book on the lessons I learned at Xerox, in a nutshell, they had extraordinary leaders. They hired the best people. And it wouldn't matter what the sales goal was or what the company objectives were, we would always just find a way to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And I like that. We set a standard of high performance. So that was a very powerful lesson. At the same time, I noticed how they were so generous with their benefits and their rewards and their incentives with people. So when I did leave, when I we had an opportunity, um, my partners and I, to start a technology company, I thought we have to be really careful in a small business that we don't over offer these incentives, bonuses, and benefits. And I don't mean that we wouldn't provide all the, the basic requirements because I never wanted to be at a time where I had to reduce those. Right. So we were generous with our people and what we had, but we always yeah. made sure that it was sustainable because I was at Xerox when they had to cut back on some of their, uh, the, the wave of Japanese competition was coming in. I mean, they had things like they sponsored time off for people to travel to foreign countries and do some missions work. They had, um, you could take off a year for social service leave. They're all wonderful things. They had um, adopt a child programs. They had such a robust and generous uh, offering. But when they scaled back then, people had felt entitled. And like they were reducing. So that was a powerful lesson I learned. Be generous, but make sure you can continue to provide those things. Yeah. The other thing I saw about Xerox was they had an extraordinary corporate strategy that was replicated throughout the country. So I liked that strategic framework from which everything else flowed. They placed a high value on people, training, and development. I saw and experienced firsthand 
what that meant to people to have a company invest in training them. So I actually went on to be the hiring and training manager for the state of Wisconsin for their salespeople, and I got to be a coach for their sales process, which is the finest sales training in the world yet today. So that was a gift. Um, when I left the company, I would say that I, in a small company, never viewed my company as small. I always thought from the day we started Intercom that we needed to think like a billion dollar player. We did not need to draw attention to or dilute our focus because we were acting small. So having said that, a lesson was I needed to ask a lot of people for help and resources. So through strategic partners like IBM and Hewlett Packard, um, Microsoft, EMC, we were able to tap into the resources of these great companies and then bring it to the field in our customers' offices. So we focused on customer relationships as job one and employee relationships, do right by the people. And then bringing this beautiful, vast array of resources from the larger companies. So I always wanted to have the best of both, a great big company capability at the same time, smaller company flexibility. I'm sure you've heard that lesson before, but we lived that, and um, it changed our view of what was possible. Yeah, and two things you you mentioned that I wanted to have you expand on, Lori, is one, you saw that there were quality leaders. I wanted to know what, what you saw. What were some of those qualities of the leaders that we should be embodying? And the second part, which I'll ask is the value, I wanna know what was valuable in the sales training that we should also be doing. Well, can we reverse the order on those? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So what I learned in the sales training is that your intentions count more than your technique. So most importantly, let your own light shine through in everything you do. Really, every business is doing business with people. So whenever I call on customers and today, I go, I am who I am. And I am not interested in them remembering everything about me. I would just as soon be invisible. I want to bring out the best in others. So when I call on my customers, no matter what the agenda is planned, to really listen to them. Yeah. And I purport that every business that is founded on the true needs and a genuine understanding of the needs of your clients will be successful to mm -hmm. some degree. So it all starts with understanding your customers. And the Xerox program originally professional selling skills, which many people across the country have certainly heard of and many have participated in, was excellent. And then they expanded that to what they called spin training, situations, problems, implications, and needs. And it's really a framework and a methodology that gets you to a point that you can understand well, why does that matter in their business and then recommend solutions or at least go down that path of exploring solutions that mm -hmm. might be relevant. You know that with your patients as a chiropractor. Each patient is different. Yeah. So what I learned from Xerox was certainly how to gain those insights. And a simple aspect of it that anyone can apply is ask open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. How many times have you been in a room where someone says, what are you thinking about this? Is it this or is it this? If you give an either or, they're going to pick one of them. Right. Just saying, what are your key considerations as you look at this technology implementation? What are the things that come to mind that are going to impact this? What have you done before that we can learn from? What's worked well and what hasn't? I always ask, no matter what I'm doing, two key questions. What are your highest hopes? Begin with the end in mind. What does success look like? If we don't know what that looks like, then yeah. we might be on a path, have a great conversation, but you know what? It's an ancillary path. Right. And it should be, like I asked you today, what is the most important? Asking those priority questions. Yeah. So what are your highest hopes? And then probably since I'm an optimist, I'm also a pragmatic realist. So also, what can go wrong? What's the worst possible outcome? 
I recently did a growth strategy session with a group of tenured people. And when I met with the president of the company, I said, what are your highest hopes? And he told me, and then I said, what could go wrong? And he goes, we go the wrong way and we don't grow at all. Well, it was really good to have that conversation and have it with his people because it takes some time to work on these things. And so we were crystal clear about watching, monitoring, and making sure that we evaluated every step along the way that we were going the right direction yeah. toward those highest selves. Yeah. So what the key lesson from Xerox is to ask open-ended questions to listen. Yeah. And then, I don't mean to oversimplify it, but that's a big part. If you think about who's called on you and who you really enjoy being with, yeah. they usually ask you great questions. Yes. I mean, it's a common denominator. Now, the other one was, what are some qualities of great leaders? So let me just sum that up just so everyone gets it, because I'm going to write it on my whiteboard after we're done, too. The highest hopes, what's most important, and then what what um, what was the last one? What uh, goes wrong? What could go wrong? Go wrong. What could go wrong, yeah. Okay. And then, I think this begin with the end in mind. Tell me what success looks like is very revealing. Now, how much time does it take to ask that question? Yeah. But what you get from that is extraordinary. Yeah. And by the way, at that point, if I'm not excited about what they're trying to accomplish or their goals are too low or it's not aspirational, then I'm not the right person for the job and I would refer them to somebody else. Right, right. Because why would we want to use our gifts to, to do something that's just quite ordinary? Yes. No, thank you for sharing that. So, you were talking about quality leaders. Yes. So, I would say that there are a lot of stereotypes about what makes a great leader. And one of the things I absolutely love about this time in our world is entrepreneurs are being viewed as the leaders that they are. And look at the different flavors and sizes and shapes and the diversity of entrepreneurs. So, a technical definition of a leader is one that others follow. And I believe that as a leader, there are a variety of personality styles that can be effective. But there are certain characteristics that are essential. The first is visionary. The ability to see what is possible in the future or what might be possible in the future. There's that element of inspiring people to follow you. The other is, probably the most essential, is critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. We live in a complex world, and it is absolutely essential for a leader today to be to see a clear path forward amidst the complexity. So I think that skill is increasingly important. And have a wonderful balance between a sense of urgency and patience. <laughs> That's a tough one. Yes, and if we impose a sense of urgency on people that work for us or on others, before they have the knowledge, skills, ability, or desire to move forward, then that is causes some frustration and not ideal outcomes. Mm -hmm. But to be able to know how to nudge people on a faster track by simply understanding better um, what it's going to take, You've got, to, you've got to pull people along, and then I always say, you know, speed it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I walk and talk to people, but, you know, constant motion. The next characteristic of a leader that I would highlight would be to have a positive view of the future. So that's a little bit different than visionary. Having that positive view of the future gives meaning to the now. Um, you probably read the book about why. and start with a why. Well, it's important to know why this matters beyond the job itself and to inspire to inspire people around that shared vision, but to have a shared vision. I just um, recently became aware of something very exciting. It was called it's called the leadership parable. So there's two types of leaders. One is the lighthouse leader and the other is the lantern leader. Have you, are you familiar with this? Mm, no. So it comes from a Chinese parable and 
some people respond well to a leadership who has this inspired vision. Others need the leader to hold a lantern so that they can see how to walk two feet in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so a wise leader knows which type of leadership style to use at different times. Mm -hmm. With the lighthouse, everybody knows where you're going, right? It's, they're following the big picture. With the lantern, even the leader does not know where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. They're going to discover it together along the way. So I thought that was very helpful because sometimes, and I use the lingo, hey, time to get out the lantern. In the absence, if you look at our country today, if you look at education, if you look at almost any situation where there's angst or frustration, I will purport to say, where's the leadership? And maybe we need to get the lantern out to move a few feet forward. Mm -hmm. So leadership is essential in forward movement. And I would say that um, in the absence of clarity, that crystal clear path forward amidst complexity, in the absence of that, that's when people lose hope, they get frustrated, and then I kind of coined this phrase recently, and that is they stall out, they check out, or they chip it out. <laughs> and success does not happen in neutral. So the leader's role is to either use the lantern or the lighthouse to move people forward, and I think that's great. The, uh, the probably one of the most definitive types of leadership traits that I admire most, it may not be for everyone, but I admire most, is servant leaders. And servant leaders have this ability on their own to inspire confidence, respect, knowledge, expertise, all those great things but that they're able to remain humble and lift others up while they're doing it. They don't speak mm -hmm. of it, you just know what it feels like. You can think of leaders in that realm. And I am so inspired by um, servant leaders. They don't describe themselves that way, others do. Right. And I, I think that the real hallmark of a leader, although I've mentioned a few skills, uh, characteristics, there's certainly many more, I've come to realize that um, the best and truest legacy any leader can leave would not be defined about them at all. It would be defined by the success, fulfillment, and dreams achieved by those that they were privileged to serve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which has been... And the organizations that they... The success of the organizations say that. Yeah. Which has been the toughest for you out of those traits to embody or to carry through? A leader is never satisfied. So for me, I want to be relevant. I'm reading, thinking, learning. They're not difficult. They're important. So I would say that the most difficult for me is if there are uh, perceived barriers that need to be removed. Um, I, I Give me a real challenge and I'll handle it. I, I, I do not enjoy or thrive when people are creating their own. Limits. Yeah. And therein lies that patience and sense of urgency that. <laughs> so what do you do what do you do to nudge people? What do I do to nudge people? Yeah, and the sense of urgency. I talk about it. I call them aside as an individual. I um, communicate with a company as a whole, with organizations as a whole, with leadership teams and as appropriate individuals to understand. Yeah. Usually through that understanding, I can figure out what I can do and what they can do. Many times I meet with teams and they empower themselves. They figure out how to move forward. People are pretty smart. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to give them the authority and the empowered environment in order to move forward. So it doesn't take me to solve it, but uh, pausing and talking about it and what's important. Mm -hmm. And then one lesson that I've learned to do is just walk into a room. You've done this. We've all done it. And there's a conversation going on, and you say to yourself, hmm, I can't believe they're having this conversation. Where is this going, and what is this meeting about? So I've learned to ask a question, to elevate the conversation. My goal is always elevate the conversation. Hmm. So I, I might say, excuse me, could somebody help me? When the agenda was set for today, um, how does this conversation fit in that context? so I can tell where to contribute. 
That's usually just something as simple as that, and it will get redirected or put on track. What I I think uh, speaking up, you know, not not accepting that things aren't going somewhere. People love to pile on. They pile on low. They pile on high. So take it up higher, and they'll all pile mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It's not that difficult, and people have inspired me and nudged me past my comfort zone. Um, like I shared with the story about the bloodmobile, but there's many examples of that. Yeah, I like that. Elevate the conversation. What elevate was... life. Elevate life, elevate business, elevate people. So, Lori, what was next after Xerox then? The Intercom was next, right? Yes. So I yeah. started the company in 1984 based solely on the understanding of the growing importance of technology in business. Now, that is almost laughable when I say that that was a vision. But at that time, PCs weren't even common. Right. And um, I worked at Xerox, where we had quality products and services. So I thought, well, why not have that in the technology area? At that time, if you can believe this, Jeremy, you had to go to a retail store if you wanted to buy a computer as a business. Right. So we actually started our company. Um, My husband and I started the company, and then we had um, an angel investor, Lauren Martinson. And he was going to rent his building to Wang Laboratories. And Wang told him about this idea. So he said, I want to get in that business. This sounds great. What is Wang Laboratories? They were a very, they were the largest, they had the highest ROI in the country for any technology company at the time. Hmm. They actually came up, they had mini computers and word processing equipment, if you can believe that. So, um, they had this national national strategy to form businesses like ours to serve the business community's technology needs. So thank you for asking that because a lot of your viewers probably don't know who Wang is. They're defunct now. Um, but we started the company, and at first, you know, the idea was great. But we formed an advisory board right away, and we listened to these people, and they said, "We're going to struggle here. You're going to struggle here with this profit model." So. Another lesson I learned is if you're not, be objective of what you're doing isn't working, changing it. In fact, I pulled over the side of the road one day with my husband and said, my partner, and said, you know, maybe I should step down as CEO. Hmm. Things just are not going right. And he said, it's not you. We need a different plan. We need a different market strategy. Uh, but I was willing to step down, and I think that's important as a leader to say, if what, if I am the reason we're not successful, then I need to be open and even bring up the fact, is it me? Mm-hmm. So um, It's a tough that, thing to do for people. It is, yet for me, I think that was my nursing background. I'm like, we got to come up with a solution and, and just really looking at all elements. So we needed to buy a franchise, and we did, and that really turned us around. Um, that was what we needed. So, and later Wang, of course, discontinued the program that they had, but we had evolved past that. So they call it today pivoting. We didn't call it that then, but right. that's what we were doing. That's what it was, yeah. We bought a franchise, and we grew from 20-some million to 40-some in one year. Wow. So So what were the services you were offering when you say you bought a franchise? Yes. Uh, we quickly said it's not going to be about the products. It's going to be about the services. So we were early adopters in that systems integration model. And if, at that time, it was the advent of the network, so we, we designed, configured, installed, and supported technology systems, wow. medium and large size companies. Okay. That's what we did. And over time, um, that continued to evolve, but we were definitely early adopters of that model, which later became the whole model for the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that we prided ourselves on is that every time we added a division, such as our web development division or our education division, it was all based on customers saying, we like working with you, we like working with your people, we need help with this. Mm. So that really links to the message that I gave about if you base your business on what customers you truly need, yeah. you'll be successful. And our business was yeah. absolutely successful because yeah. of our customers. And listening to them, like you said. you Because know, yeah. if you were listening to them, then you know we just do this, and you're not really listening to what their needs are. Mm-hmm. That was job one with for me as CEO, 
to spend almost all my time in the field listening to customers and listening to employees. I schedule something called executive interviews with my employees. And once a year, I'd meet with every employee when we were at the size that I could do that and yeah. just ask them about their dreams and what was important to them. And I'll tell you, I would be so inspired thinking after those interviews saying, this person's working for me and they have all these dreams in the world and they have all these talents. I would just always be so grateful to those rock star employees that were choosing to work at our company. Yeah. Those, that was a great source of inspiration to me. Yeah. What were some of those big turning point customers? Because again, like you started from scratch, you have to get customers. What were some right. of those big ones? Well, I remember um, a large insurance company that they were one of the 10 largest companies in the our marketplace. And I said, they will be our customers one day. I'm certain of it. So we put together a strategy team. We had multiple meetings over quite a few years. And then one day, um, our angel investor had mentioned something to one of the executives there, and he asked me to come and meet with him. So I jumped at the chance. and went in, and he had this little... Um, it was a computer card, but it's the size of an index card. And he had like three questions on it for me. And he wanted to know if we could do those things. And one of them was to provide the technology to their insurance companies across the United States. And when I say the insurance, it was actually the credit unions across the United States that were members. And so we could do all of that. And we put together a plan and started providing technology to these um, members of theirs all over the country. And I thought, how ironic, they became our customer because we did the part that was hard for somebody else. So the easy part would be fulfilling all the business requirements locally. But right. we did all this national work that took a lot of time and a lot of expertise. Right. And then ultimately we ended up with the local business too. But I think that's... a great example of waiting until the time is right and doing something for your customer that maybe other people can't do. And that was a great lesson for us. So as we started calling on other customers, we'd say, we know you're working with somebody else right now. That's just fine. What do you not want them to be doing to distract their focus? Or what's difficult for you? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we can help with that. And I will tell you, many of our customers, that was our way to open the door, that we did what was difficult or not easy. Yeah. And um, we did that at a very high level of success. Yeah. So that was a beautiful pathway to long-term loyal client relationships. Yeah. And our clients were like a who's who list. Um, I couldn't wait to go see our clients. They were so smart. They were so dedicated. They were such good people. And the reason I can say that is, we didn't take on customers unless the values were in alignment. Mm -hmm. So I have to tell you, Jeremy, that we never had a negative parting to my knowledge because we started, even if we exited for some reason, because we started the conversations with this is how we do business and how do you do business and what are your core values. And some of our customers said, I'm not sure, I'll go get them. I'll go find out. Hmm. But you know, that was the basis of all of our relationships. And it's hard not to be able to work through things when you're yeah. talking about this is our integrity and we are committed to doing yeah. right by each other. It's not, it's, it's what's, what is the best for the good of the whole? And um, in that light, we had just extraordinary customers in all of our markets that there were models of these are good companies for the world. And we were so proud to support what they do in the world through technology. Did you find that the customers that maybe didn't match up with core values that you couldn't accept as a customer, did they not have core values at all, or was was there a pattern? This was infrequent. What I would tell you was that they didn't always talk about them, so we brought that to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And they might not even, if you call them, they might not even recall that part of it because it was so natural, but it was absolutely at the mm -hmm. front. I see. Um, they would recall we had positive relationships. But this focus on values, there were a sh less than a handful where we didn't 
want to pursue something. And we, we wouldn't necessarily have to make it that blatant. Yeah. Uh, maybe we were just a little more expensive yeah. on that proposal. I'm just wondering if there's a red flag that we should be seeing, like people out there listening should be seeing and looking for so that they don't, you know, experience a bad exit or, you know, yes. have... Yes, so a red flag is demanding customers without consideration for impact on your people or your company. That doesn't mean that they don't have to be cost competitive, but this throwing our weight around to get the lowest price and the cheap that just you, you don't want you don't need that business. Mm -hmm. The the green flag, full speed ahead, would be they're willing to share what their strategic objectives are and they're willing to establish a partnership. Yeah. So it's about partnership versus a transaction. Relationship versus transaction. Yeah. Those are just a few comments. Yeah. That so, helps. Yeah, for sure. And you know, when you mentioned launching across the, the nation, you know, yes. part of me gets gets um, nervous because you need a lot more people for that. How do you how do you manage the hiring uh, process and training process? Because you grew to 150 people. Right. Yeah. And they're 300 plus today. So I look at every stage of development in a company. There's key milestones, there's metrics, there's productivity metrics so you can see ratios that you need. So you have some indicators of what the ratio of people should be to the work that should be done, etc. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, you can't be underfunded if you're going to be expanding another location. So I always encourage a pilot. Go into another market, mm -hmm. and as you're doing it, establish best practices that you can replicate in other markets. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you this. There is one essential lesson when you're going into other markets, and that is the people in that market need to feel that you have hired locally. They don't want people imported from someplace else. That doesn't mean you can't backfill with resources for projects, but the person that sits in the meeting needs to be local. Mm. at least perceived as local. Now, in today's world, where you and I are in the same room together via Skype, nice. um, that gives some allowances. But they don't want, they really want to work with somebody in their market. Yeah. So um, that consideration is important. Scaling up, I always, in conjunction with our annual meeting, um, met with Lauren Martinson, our angel investor, and said, this is what it looks like that we're going to need for resources this year. It might be $2 million, it might be $3 million. We were good at predicting what our investments and our expenses were going to be based on a higher level of, of business. Mm -hmm. So whether that was locally or nationally. So it's important to have a plan and to have the resources, the people and the money. It's mm -hmm. not scary, it's essential um, you know, don't ever ask me to manage a company that's not growing. I can't manage stagnancy, but managing growth is easy. Mm -hmm. So it's the leader's role to make sure there's clarity around that. But I will also tell you that for us, we were a member of a national industry association. And so they had people that would come and help us and say, we'll help you with the interviewing. We've got referrals for people. Um, there are so many resources that we tapped into that it, it, was, it wasn't scary. Um, it's interesting that you react that way. Although when I'm meeting with entrepreneurs, a lot of them are afraid of that. And I, I would say, you've got to be bold there. You you have to be bold. Bring in the A players and make sure you've got funding to support that. Otherwise, don't grow there yet. Because mm -hmm. if you're going to skimp on it, you're going to trip. And who wants to go in and not be the best? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, obviously, Lori, in this journey... There's a lot of bumps in the road and high points. I want to hear a low point and then a high point. Sure. So, a low point. I think a low point for me was when I pulled over in the parking lot that day and said I would step down. Yeah. Believe me, I thought about what that would mean if I did that. But at the same time, it was a high point. Because you know what? It was kind of freeing. Right. When you embrace that. It's like, I I liked myself that day. 
because I knew that the, it was very clarifying that things don't have to be about me at all yeah. to make my life worthwhile. And so I was very clarifying. I don't know what time in that day it was clarifying, but it, it you know it was definitely humbling, and my voice was quiet, and I was very serious. Um, and then another low point, I think, was when um, we sold a significant minority portion of our shares in the late nineties. And to a multi-billion dollar player, of whom we had a franchise. I was on, I was chair of their national advisory council, very engaged as an industry leader. They wanted to buy our company. Hmm. Um, I think it's okay I reveal that as long as I don't say their name. Yeah. I don't, so, I don't edit anything. So yes, don't say, no, their, don't so, say their name. <laughs> so, no, that's, I, but I, I'm very respectful because everything's yeah. confidential. Yeah. And I said, I don't want to run a company where I don't have 51% control and able to do the right thing. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. people and my customers. So I said, nope, that would squish my spirit. So they bought a significant minority portion in our company. Well, every year we did our strategic planning and we did contingency planning. And that year we had said, okay, what if we lose our largest customer who is our big education customer? What if this? What if that? And one of the contingency things was, plans was, what if the company that bought this minority position in our company went bankrupt? Hmm. We kind of laughed about that because we said they're the multi-billion dollar player, here's little us doing a contingency plan if they went under. Well, and they were an industry leader. Well, lo and behold, that following year they did in fact file bankruptcy wow. and cease operations. And it was quite fortuitous because, well, first of all, there were so many good leaders there and good people there, and it was market timing. So um, we understood that they had gotten a little bit ahead in terms of offering the services versus the hardware kind of thing, but they had courageously brought a model forward that certainly whose time unfolded. So it's, with all due respect, that company was on the right path. The timing wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about it with our board and we said, you know, people are calling from all over saying, what's happening, what's happening? And um, we made a decision along with our board that we wanted to go first in line to settle this. We didn't want it to be a distraction hanging over our heads. And you know, we were so blessed we were able to buy back our shares and move forward. Wow. How many times do you get a chance to have a second chance with the company? So once again, um, the three of us, Warren Mortensen, Gary Hoffman, and myself, were on that business, and then some of our employees. We have employee owners as, as well. That was important to me yeah. to help reward the people that have been with us. But that was enlightening. At the same time, we still had some risk because customers were hearing this. This was all over the marketplace. And at that time, bankruptcies were a little less frequent than they are today. <laughs> So it was a, a time of more stability versus instability. Yeah. And so I decided that it was up to me as the CEO to go call on every customer and tell them I do not have all the answers. Yeah. But what I will tell you is, as I have them, I will share them from you. You won't hear them from anyone else. And if you have a question, you call me. I'm going to make a commitment to you. And that is any product or service that we provided through this national player, we will replace with an equal to or better solution for you, or we will get out of that business. Yeah. So that model served us well, and we came through that, and it was really quite miraculous. And um, with no, we didn't lose any customers, we didn't lose any employees, yeah. um, because they knew what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, so I that like that. And, and, wow. And the yeah, I don't even know how you predicted that um, in that meeting at the contingency, contingency plan. You know, we have two minutes, Lori, and I want to hear one of your proud moments. After, you know, you started this company, you saw it through for 25 years, through the sale, what's been a proud moment? Um, a proud moment in business or a proud moment in life? Either one. I think my proudest personal moment was when my parents were honored in my hometown a few years ago on Memorial Day. They were both veterans. Oh, wow. Um, 
a big part of why I care so much about people is to honor the example that they set for us. Yeah. So that's um, anything I can do to honor that. Yeah. In, in business, my... And for people who don't know, right now was just Memorial Day, by the way. You know, as we're doing this. So, exactly. yes, that is, that's really touching. Wow. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. And um, the and the gratitude I had to the people in my hometown, which we could express to them for the love and support that they gave to my parents and my family over yeah. many years. Yeah. Uh, my proudest business accomplishment, gosh darn it, Jeremy, that sure better be ahead of me. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> My proudest times yeah. are when I've reached out to a person yeah. in the business world and released him at a higher level. And no, I've had the privilege. It's not about me, it's through me. Yeah. And at my company, uh, my gratitude for the people that chose to work at my company, to see them start as young people and then the faces of their life and their families and see what they're able to do, um, that's been so meaningful to see the level of success the other people have and that they're happy, good people in the world. Yeah. Um, I just hope, I just celebrate that my company was better because they, that they were there yeah. and I hope they're better people because they shared the yeah. journey with me. Yeah. Laura, I really appreciate your time. I know you have another meeting and that was so touching. I really appreciate you sharing all that and about your parents. So thank you so much. I got a lot out of it. I know everyone else did too. Where can people check you out so they can... Um, uh, on the web? So I don't have a website. I try to keep a little profile. I know that probably makes you smile. Um, but if someone has a question, they can email me at Lori dot Benson at LB, like Lori Benson, unlimited dot com. Yeah. And then, um, Jeremy, if you don't mind, you can put that out at the end of the yeah. clip or whatever. We'll do. Um, and then supporting entrepreneurs today, I always make time and answer yeah. people's questions. Um, so don't hesitate to yeah. send me an email. Yeah. I'd be happy to help others on the journey. Very As generous. Way, thank you for everybody who's helped me. And thank you, Jeremy, for thank everything you. you're doing to share these stories. Yeah. It's very generous of you. And thank you so much, Lori. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Stay tuned. Yes. To the future. Go Badgers. I was just my fellow alum there. Thank you. Great to get to know you today. Yes, you too. Okay.